So finally, we're looking at uh, consequentialism or utilitarianism as our second moral or ethical decision-making model. I've, I've said that uh, both Kantianism and consequentialism uh, start from sort of pre-existing moral intuitions that are widely shared. And the, the moral intuition here is that in whatever we do, we're trying to produce the best outcome. And the best outcome is really defined by its effect on human beings and the way that we normally measure the positive or negative in terms of effect on human beings in terms of happiness. So you might say that, that utilitarianism says two things, that whether an action is good or bad depends upon its consequences, so hence consequentialism, and uh, two, that those consequences are to be measured in terms of happiness. Uh, so, um, some interesting results from that. I mean, I, I think that, at least in the material that I gave you, the, the, the claim there is that if you're consequentialist, that you do not believe that any action is uh, inherently good or bad. It is only good or bad in terms of the actual effects that uh, the action has on human beings. That may jive with a lot of our intuitions. That is, uh, it would certainly say, it would certainly support the idea that every ethical situation is different, and that it's very difficult to come up with rules for ethics because uh, the situations that we find ourselves in are so different that a rule which may produce a positive, good outcome in one situation may be completely useless or produce uh, an even even a bad situation, a bad outcome in another situation. So the idea, I think, of utilitarianism is this, uh, that, that, that we want to do good in the world, and, and that means that we want to make it ourselves happy, and we want to make anybody who's involved or anybody who's affected by our actions happy. Now, of course, uh, you know, the problem is that sometimes uh, you can't have everything. Uh, uh, sometimes you can't both make yourself happy by an action and make the other people who are affected by it happy as, as well. Sometimes you can't make all the people who are affected by your action happy. So, so how do you decide what to do? Well, one of the originators of utilitarianism, uh, Jeremy Bentham, in the late 18th, maybe beginning of the 19th century, developed something that became known as Bentham's calculus. Uh, listen, you're, you're deciding, you know, you're trying to decide what to do. Uh, what you need to do is, is this. Think of the anticipated outcome of your action. Uh, and think of its effects on everyone whose well-being is involved, meaning everyone whose happiness in, is involved. That would mean yourself and whoever else is, is you anticipate will be affected. Um, anticipate all the good uh, that will result, that is all the happiness that will result, and anticipate all the unhappiness that will result. Add up all the goods, that is add up all the happiness that, that would result from your action, and then add up all the unhappiness that would result from your action. If the happiness that would result from your action outweighs the unhappiness, then you, you can do it, and perhaps should do it. If the unhappiness that would result from your action uh, outweighs the happiness, then you know that you shouldn't do it, that it's a bad action. Because good and bad are really measured in terms of happiness and unhappiness anyway. Uh, there are all sorts of, you know, the, which the philosophers go into ad nauseum, all sorts of problems. H how do you measure happiness? Is it purely in terms of pleasure and pain, or are some pleasures better than others, or are some pains worth, uh, you know, uh, experiencing, et cetera, all sorts of uh, problems. But as a rough decision-making model, it makes plenty of sense. Uh, it just means basically to take into account all the interests of everyone, including yourself, uh, who would be affected uh, by your action and make your decision on that basis, that is, on your anticipation of uh, how much good, meaning how much happiness, would come out of your action, and how much bad, meaning how much unhappiness, would come out of your action. Now, if we looked at, again, at Kelly's situation in Chapter 2, this may free her up to a certain extent uh, from the sort of rigid Kantian Directive that uh, that seemed to result for her from applying Kant's decision-making model. If we were to, if she were to be interested in doing the right thing, and not just being selfish or cowardly or you know whatever, she uh, 
she would uh, think about, you know, she has two choices. One is to continue what she's doing and do nothing and, and let the release of chromium-6 into the environment continue. The, the other would be to do whatever she could to stop it. Uh, so if she, uh, if she does nothing, which is what she's doing now, and lets the release of the toxin into the environment continue, then she is preserving her own happiness. She needs a job. She is preserving the happiness of her parents, apparently, who are financially dependent upon her. And she's preserving the happiness, perhaps, of fellow employees uh, at the company. So those are all goods. Uh, the bads uh, is, are that she is, uh, that poisons are being released into an environment unknowing, unknowingly, or, or without the potential victims of those poisons knowing it, and that's the public. And perhaps, you know, also the environment in general, plants and animals and stuff, but I don't think I've sufficiently gone into in that chapter. Kelly acts as if, from what she says, that there's only plants and animals being put at risk, but that's absurd. Whenever you release poisons into the environment, human beings are potentially at risk. So we have to take that into account. And so she is at least potentially risking their health, their lives, and therefore risking causing them unhappiness. Now that notion of risk is a very important one, isn't it? Which will come up again for engineers because so many of the decisions that need to be made with technology involve risk, um, risking somebody's harm, you know, and we're in conditions of uncertainty. So that complicates the matter to some degree. Uh, but if we ignore that for the moment, then w simply what Kelly has to do is to ask herself whether the potential unhappiness that's being caused by the release of toxins in the environment is outweighed by the happiness that is preserved by releasing toxins into the environment or by her doing nothing about it. And that doesn't really give us a definite um, answer that she can come out with, you know, like right away. Like, like she has to actually think about it. But um, it gives her a framework, for, I mean, it's a framework for further thought. I mean, it becomes an empirical question, really. That, that is, she's got to determine at this point um, how much unhappiness, potentially at least, is, uh, is being caused by the release of these toxins. And she's got to, you know, do some hard thinking about that. Now, it may be very difficult, but I think she could come up with a kind of a rough answer. Uh, and whether the happiness that she's that being preserved uh, on, on her part and her parents and the other employees, it, it outweighs that happiness. You know, I, I got to say that thinking about it, she's probably, you know, not going to be able to, in all good conscience, continue doing nothing. I mean, that is, if we think about the potential number of people uh, who are typically put in harm's way by release of poisons into the environment and weigh their potential unhappiness against the happiness of a very few people, you know, that maybe a her and her parents primarily, but then mm, the few dozens that may be affected in terms of their jobs, it, it doesn't look good for Kelly doing nothing. Which is interesting because that's the same uh, result that I think we got from applying Kant's uh, model. Um, but, you know, again, uh, th th there are the models and then there are how the models are applied. The way that I've applied them, the way that I've, and just the, the outcomes that I've gotten from applying them, would perhaps not be the same as other people's application of the models, which is interesting. So it's not like there's a definite answer in all cases, but, but you get an answer. So um, I think that these two ethical decision-making models, uh, utilitarianism on the one hand and Kantianism on the other, they're good to have in your back pocket. I mean, most of the ethical decisions we make, we make in an intuitive way without thinking through in some sort of step-by-step -step or really articulate way where we articulate the problem and we really think it through and, and apply our reason to it and really reflect on it deeply. We do do that. We don't always do that. But there are some situations in which we do it because what, what we should do is, is not exactly clear. 